me. This meeting is being recorded, so I am going to waste no more time. We will kick things off with Lori and Erica. Thank you. Um, Hello, everyone. Go ahead, Erica. No, you go ahead. Hi, um, I'm Lori Jones. I am a teacher in the K-12 system currently, but I have worked in online open educational resources as a sort of a consultant for tech things and also to provide my own for my students. Um, and I'm coming to you from the traditional territories of the Sinaiks, the Silikes, and the Tanaha, which is in the Kootenays in British Columbia. And oh, I guess I'll introduce myself. Um, I'm, I'm Erica. Um, I, I believe I'm on Musqueam territory here, but there's um, um, in Vancouver, there's uh, a few different um, uh, uh, First Nations in the area. So, but I believe it's, I believe my, this, I believe Richmond is Musqueam, although it was a transient place. So um, with um, uh, my background is kind of as a storyteller and an educator, and I've sort of done everything from preschoolers to elder hostels and these days that's uh, uh, sort of at the college level. Um, and this, because she's being quite noisy in the background, is Miss Ella. So Anyhow, I'll pass things over to Lori. All right, so our talk today um, is, are you listening accessibility of uh, open educational resources? So my question to all of you would be, what does accessibility mean to you? Just think about that for a second. Um, if you wanna quickly type something in the chat, um, we'll start to look at that, but what does it mean to you? What does accessibility mean to you in in all areas of things, but specifically in open educational resources. Accessibility is a civil right to full participation. Everyone can access it, no barriers, not being let out. Um, anyone can access it, okay. Having something is all people choice, okay. Those are some good starting places, resources that are usable. Uh, a variety of formats, an equal experience, intentional design, okay. Availability of variety of formats, discoverable and meaningful. All right, we're on the right track. Okay, I kind of covered Erica, sorry Erica. Um, in online education, so is it different for you in online education? Oh, I like giving everyone an opportunity to participate, including those with, with like parenting responsibilities. Mm -hmm. Format doesn't change the definition. All right. Oh, I just made the chat very large. That's not helpful for me. Go ahead, Erica. Okay. Oh, I thought you were doing all the questions. Oh yeah, I can do them all. Sure. Uh, when you answered the last question, where were you coming from? What perspective did you have when you answered that question? Are you a parent? Are you someone who accesses online um, education as a student or are you coming in from it as an instructor or an institutional organization or a designer? Like what perspective did you come from when you answered that question about what it looks like? I'm gonna hit you with a lot of questions here at the beginning. So instructional designers, creators, student, parent, techie. <laughs> I like the techie um, tag. Uh, and designer, faculty advisor course. Okay, perfect. All right, so for those of you that are uh, instructional designers, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna hit you with what we've got. So if you wanna go to the next one, Erica. Um, so where does your knowledge of what makes something accessible come from? So where did you get your information about accessibility? Have you been, has it come in form of PD? Was it part of maybe your training? Um, where did it come from? So what, what are you, where are you getting your information about accessibility? Disability services office. So from your institution, okay. Professional organizations. So professional development. All right. Experience, that's a, a valid one. Um, web aim, a lot of Googling. Fair, those are all fair places to get information. Um, so following the sub, following the experts on the subject. Okay, so 
a lot of accessibility offices and campuses. Awesome. Do you want to keep going, Erica? Um, so I actually can't see the, oh, never mind. I'll just read it off my page. Um, so who, who basically, who, sorry, my screen, there's a big thing in the middle of it because of the recording. Do you mind just reading that, Lori? Which thing? The question on the screen. Oh, sure. Who decides what makes something accessible? So who gets to, who gets to give you the parameters of what is, what is accessibility? I've, I've seen a lot of, um, campus accessibility offices, but why do they get to decide? So I've got the students, some of the people who you are using the resource, those using the service. It seems we're in agreement and anyway, you're all mostly in agreement about who gets to decide. Um, and are they the right person to decide? So you're, you all, uh, most of the most of the answers were like the people using the service. Oh, I've also got the government. Um, so what gives them the right to make something, just to decide if something is accessible? So you're saying who has expertise on accessibility, the end user should decide. So in my experience, um, most of these things that you're talking about, a special consortium, we're talking about a large body of people that have given sort of parameters around accessibility. A lot of you talked about your accessibility um, departments within your institutions, and they're usually the ones making decisions about how accessible something is. Now, does that re relate to the end user? Does that give us the end user's perspective? So if I am a student, can I say, hey, this doesn't work for me. I need for it to come in whatever format, or I need more time, or I need all of those things within an open educational context. Are we allowed to do that? Or, or are we being dictated to by the people that are supposed to know, the experts in the institution? So just to streamline this a little bit, because we're running out of time, um, I, all these questions are questions that, that Lori and I asked this summer when we were taking an, an, a, a course on ableism, equity, and uh, technology. And um, we're both students that have disabilities, as well as both being instructors. And so I know for myself, I, had, um, I was going into my master's with a concussion or no, I didn't have a concussion at the start. I was going in right after a car accident and uh, had just been diagnosed with ME and uh, fibromyalgia and a bunch of damage to my spine. And, uh, uh, you know, my first course went, went relatively well. I was being, you know, thought that I had all this under control and then a second car accident hit me. And I took about uh, six months off and I thought I was totally fine. And then I went back into courses and I discovered that I was having post-concussion, uh, that I had post-concussion syndrome now. And that made it difficult sort of going through my academic readings, especially online. Um, and had I not taken charge of my accessibility, I probably would have failed out of the program, even though I know that I'm getting some of the highest marks in the program. Um, but that took me sort of advocating for myself. And it's not necessarily the same for every student who has accessibility issues. Um, there's another gentleman in our program who's dealing with the same sorts of uh, diagnoses as I've got, yet what works for him does not work for me. Um, and some of the things do. So like, for example, um, one of the things that we've been building a lot of um, resources around is mindfulness and relaxation. And we're putting, I'm putting those into my student, my classes now at BCIT. Um, we've, um, I had, and I'll just quickly hop out of my slides. I had a wonderful chat yesterday with this woman and um, her name is, um, actually I'm not gonna go into her words right now because I'm looking at the time and I don't think we have the time for it. So I'll share it afterwards. Um, um, it'll take me a little bit of editing to do, but this uh, woman by the name of Jane uh, Bernard is like this wonderful author and she one has minute, any, one minute remaining. 
And uh, she actually left her master's program because um, she didn't have any say over how to make uh, her program accessible. So Laurie, do you wanna take the last little bit? Sure, so what we've done, what we're attempting to do is create a resource um, for instructors and designers and students alike to include the voice of the student uh, with, a dis with disability. So uh, we have um, an open educational resource uh, that is available on, so far it's on uh, story to go um, which we are hoping to continue to add the voice of those who have disability into what actually works. So are you listening to the accessibility of open learning? We actually made a faux pas in the beginning of this. And if anyone can find out how we were ableist in the title of our uh, talk, kudos to you because we